Good evening, my name's Rebecca Adil and I'm the director of HistFest, who are delighted to have partnered with the British Library to bring you tonight's special event, Molly Houses and Madams, Unraveling Georgian Subcultures. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Should you wish to submit questions to any of the speakers, please feel free to do this using the question box below. Also below the video, you'll find social media links should you wish to continue the conversation on other platforms. If you could submit some event feedback using the menu above, that would be marvellous. It really does help the British Library plan future cultural events. You can donate to the library there as well. Also in the menu above, you'll find a tab to the bookshop where you can explore a range of titles from Gaze the Word, looking at LGBT plus history. Now, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce award-winning playwright Mark Ravenhill, best-selling author and historian Professor Kate Williams, and award-winning tour guide Dan Vo. Well, howdy do, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful HistFest event in collaboration with the British Library. And of course, it is the middle of LGBT plus History Month, so a very merry LGBT plus History Month to you. Now, over the next hour, we're going to be talking about Georgian life in London, and we're going to unravel the Georgian subcultures that existed in the 18th century. And we're going to have to think about how that shapes the city that we know of today and how it sort of still has an impact in our society today as well. But I am joined by a couple of amazing speakers. So thank you so much to Kate Williams and also to Mark Ravenhill for joining me tonight. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, for me, uh, of course, I, I need to just get everybody to do a very quick shimmy as well, because you're all looking fabulous as well. Look at all that sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> so you've dressed for the occasion. So, uh, Mark, I wanted to start with you because I wanted to kind of get everybody into thinking about what George and London was like. And I've got to say, it's about 20 years now. This year will be the 20th anniversary of your fabulous play, which is Mother Claps Molly House. But I thought if you could set stage for us by sort of describing to us what you think Georgian London was like you know what where did people go shopping where did they go to have a drink and make merry I think it's it does when, when I read the research I think for me it's sort of the beginning of our of, of our age I could feel myself quite close to that culture I think the sudden explosion of news and gossip and scandal sheets uh all that sudden access to, to printed information and the hunger for, for news, I feels you know, very much like our, our internet hungry age. Uh, the explosion of the arrival of women on the women on the stage and, and the return of the theater and a theater that looks much more like our theater, the, the proscenium arch theater based in the West End, uh, Kate arrived for the first time, you know, theatres have been closed down and Shakespeare's theatre was configured very differently from ours and uh, was, you know, largely written in, in blank verse and suddenly you've got comedy written in prose on, on the stage. Um, a busy mercantile place and, as you say, shopping. Uh, you know, none of these things happen overnight. Obviously, the Elizabethans had their shopping, but I think uh, shopping in, in the sense that we have it that's starting to become actually a, a, a pastime and a, and a pleasure for, for certain sections of society, um, an unruliness. I mean, the trouble with apprentices, which does actually go back to the Elizabethans, but the sense that there's, there's youth, particularly young men, uh, who don't really have any ties and quite, can quite easily become discontented, uh, you know, has that sort of mods and rockers, sort of quadrophenia, sort of feel about it, about the apprentice culture. So when I started to uh, read about the period, it didn't feel so much of a stretch as to have, you know, there's, there's a great pleasure in stretching your imagination and trying to imagine the Elizabethan period, uh, you know, or, or imagining even the Civil War, but suddenly, uh, and the interregnum, but once we're into this century, into the 1720s, I sort of thought, I don't feel so far away from that. So I think it's got a lot that's, that's of us, of now. And of course, in the title of the play, The Molly House Features, and I'd like you to maybe just give an idea of what The Molly House was. What was the purpose of a Molly House? That was an incredible, uh, realization when I started to read about the Molly houses. I'd, I, I'd uh, seen little references to them in various just sort of sweeping queer histories and 
uh, Richter Norton had produced a fantastic book called Mother Claps Molly House, which is the proper scholarly work. I mean, you know, mine is, uh, I'd approached it as a, as a theatre maker. Um, but, and then I went back to the, to the primary sources, which we can talk a bit more about maybe later. But um, it was a real eye-opener. Eye and I think uh, to people who you tell about it for the first time, it's still a real eye-opener. So there were a number of houses um, houses, sort of in the literal sense, but also houses being used in a remarkably sim similar way to the way that the term house is used in New York ballroom culture. If anybody's watched the TV series Pose, you become a member of a house and you identify with the house. And, and I doubt whether any of those gay and trans people who formed those New York houses in the 80s, I doubt whether they'd uh, were deliberately referencing the Molly houses, but it's interesting that they came up with a very similar con uh, construct that you found your house, you identified as being a member of your house and your house had a mother. Uh, you named somebody your mother and often the mothers often do seem to have been uh, cis women, uh, but around them uh, would gather uh, queer men and some queer women and binary people. Uh, they would adopt house manners, they would adopt names. Uh, again, very reminiscent with uh, 80s queer culture, but also punk culture that, you know, you might become Sid Vicious or whatever in, in, in punk culture, that here you might rename yourself Hardware Nan or Princess Serafina or something like that. Um, and you would attend the house, there would be dancing, uh, quite a lot of lovemaking. Uh, but also there were mock marriage ceremonies, there were mock birthing ceremonies, and a couple of the queens, they would often identify themselves with the word queens, uh, would adopt a wooden baby that would be first presented in this birthing ceremony and hold actually afternoon, sometimes it's implied, sort of tea parties for their families. So there was a whole sort of playing out, sort of parodic playing out of the heterosexual world. Uh, all happening probably from the end of the 17th century for 20 or 30 years until there's a real clamp down towards the end of the 1720s and the culture seems to more or less disappear underground or disappear completely and start to transmogrify. And not only all of that, um, it was seems to be a largely working class culture. I think when we think about queer cultures, we have two sort of... Uh, cliches which bear you know which have some reality to truth or, uh, we either think of the sort of louche aristocrat culture uh maybe finally epitomized in the sort of oscar wilde life the sort of places that oscar wilde would would go to where uh queer culture was uh something dominated by american men and then obviously we have uh more contemporary way queer culture is very much defined by sort of american terms and and the whole vocabulary of contemporary queer and gay identities very much come from America. But he was in London uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, I think a very widely publicly acknowledged uh, working class, gender fuck, if I may use the word at the British Library, uh, gender fuck community, um, you know, when you find that out, you just go, oh my God, my mind has just been blown. Is this, it's true, and it's true. You've broken the floodgates now, so we can all use the <laughs> word now. But <laughs> if I could turn to you, Kate, now, in terms of, we've talked about the Molly Houses. If we could talk about the other half, which is the Maddens, so that we're talking about Molly Houses and Maddens tonight, um, but also well, the Monarch as well. It'd be great for me to kind of get from you an idea of, you know, let's populate the stage that Mark has created for us now. So who is living it? Who is the ruling monarch? And, and then most importantly, I think, is who is the Society for the Reformation of Manners? And why were they so influential in this world over these subcultures that we're, we're, we're talking about? Well, this is it's so fascinating, isn't it? I just love Mark bringing it to life there. It was really marvellous. And, you know, what you have really is when Charles II comes to the throne, he when he sets up the theatres and says there can be theatres in Covent Garden, this changes everything. Covent Garden becomes a completely new type of area and around it grow up all kinds of places where you can really 
express yourself in so many different ways. There are there are banyos, which we would call brothels. That you know, you might think they're actually got sort of Turkish baths or something, but they're generally just we what we would call brothels. And there are these houses that Mark was talking about the incredible figure of of Molly Claff. I mean, she's amazing, isn't she? She gives false testimony to someone to so he doesn't hang for sodomy. She's you know she's she's such an incredible figure and the and 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 loved by everyone. And so and you have all kind and people who are very you know Princess Serafina as Mark was talking about. You know she's a fantastic figure that everyone is you know everyone talks about everyone sees that she has these fabulous clothes and it is rather sad that we tend to know about these people through the the report the court reports in which we you know it's it's the it's the raid on mother claps molly house that we tend to know about it's the it's the prostitutes when they get caught but what you see uh, so Charles II um, brings back the theatres. Women are on the stage for the first time, and it's an incredible moment that socialising happens. And uh, Covent Garden, the brothels start, um, nightclubs start, what we would call a nightclub, many, many taverns, coffee houses. And there really is a sort of... Um, a, a sort of a thin line between a lot of what a lot of the places do. So, so for example, one of the most successful um, Co Covent Garden coffee houses, Mol King, Mol King and, and Tom King. And that was very well known for being a place where prostitutes could, sex workers could meet their clients and discuss. So, but it was impossible to raid. So you have a, a huge surge in sex work, in, in sex work of all of, of, of all varieties in London, but particularly of young women looking for sex work. Many of these women come from all over the country. Some of them come from all over the world. It's really seen as the biggest sort of, uh, sort of nightclub destination. And many of these women, are, of course, you know, sadly exploited. The men in the, the Molly houses, they are men wishing to meet up with each other. They're, these are these are women who we would say they were trafficked. Um, they are many of them very, very young women. And really, it's a consequence of, of, of two things. It's a consequence that there are London is surging as a city. There are huge amounts of people moving to London and particularly huge amounts of single men who are required to work there, who leave some, the, the wealthier ones leave their families in the country and the country estates, the poor ones are sort of bunking together when, when, when they need to earn money. There are sailors and soldiers. So women houses, brothels grow up to, to service these men. And also it really reflects the uh, the, the, the female in, female employment at the time, how insecure it was, how women had very few options and service, which was the main destination for young women, young women of the really every class apart from the mid, upper middle and upper. Um, you could be it wasn't you could be thrown out on your ear if you're mad if you're if you're madam if you, she suddenly thought she didn't like you anymore she could literally that was it you were out without a reference and without a reference called a character you were never going to find another job so you do find women flocking to Covent Garden because there's no other way to earn some women work there part-time to to supplement their income and what is surprising is to the level of of activity we think there is there, how comparatively few prosecutions there were. And it's definitely seemed to be the case that sometimes they literally, the magistrates turned a blind eye. It was thought that, especially the younger girls, hopefully they will turn off, turn to the good. And really as a, as a madam, if you're not doing extra gambling or any other extra activity that is seen as uh, sort of black market activity, you can usually get away with it. Although there are sometimes raids and the Society for the Reformation of Manners, they, they are the antithesis of the Molly Houses, the expression, the fun, the brothels, the nightlife. They really are set up um, after William and Mary come to the throne in, and, and after, so we have Charles II, then his brother James II, who is very hated, and he is deposed from the throne by his son-in-law, William, and his daughter, Mary. And they are seen as the beginning of a new morality. And there is a lot of anti-Catholic prejudice. There's a lot of feeling that, you know, Britain could be condemned by having been ruled by someone who had Catholic sympathies. Therefore, we must go the other way. And these societies are set up by respectable gentlemen. And what they are trying to do is stamp out um, uh, homosexual activity, uh, extramarital sex, brothels, gaming, um, swearing, drunkenness, anything that they might see as bad. I mean, we always have these societies, but usually what these kind of societies do are um, they just go around and lecture people and they put on sermons and they, 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 they publish pamphlets. But they felt this society in the 1690s, that, that wasn't enough. So they were going to actually prosecute people. And what they do is they employ 
uh, officers to go out there and, and seize people and arrest them. And many of these are the thief takers, the typical guy who works as a thief taker. Um, and and this is actually incredibly unpopular. Lots of people uh, in this, obviously, in the communities are very distressed by the by by the, these arrests, by the, the behavior of these of these thief takers. But also, some people in general feel that it's going too far, and that these thief takers, these virtue officers, are really sort of working on commission, as it were. The more they arrest, the more they earn, and so there is corruption. So you 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 see this battle between. One two types of London: the Reformation, Society of Reformation and Protection of Banners, and the the and, and London's nightlife. But the line isn't clear. There are a lot of people who would see themselves as who are very very respectable people who would never go near Covent Garden. You would say, oh, "I'm very respectable," but they felt that the societies were going too far, and they really, uh, you know, they they when they when in the 1730s when the gin they try to crack down on gin drinking there becomes it, it becomes you know incredibly controversial and many of their officers find themselves chased out of of the areas so you know Covent Garden is both this in, incredible place of nightlife a place of exploitation for young people in particular and a place where some have pleasure and some suffer for it and also a place in which these sort of people are stalking it trying to cut, shut it down and failing every time well in terms of the placement of Covent Garden on the very cusp of that is Tottenham Court Road, where in the 1920s there was a Molly house that was run by a free black man, Julius Caesar Taylor, who who was oh, raided. Yeah. So that's early the 1920s. And by the 1926, this is when the Mother Clap uh, House, which is roughly close to Holborn at the moment, uh, that's when that particular Molly house was raided. And Kate, you've already said that you know her, her case is incredibly important. It's in the Old Bailey Papers. We can read it, uh, the testimony on that. Uh, and also on top of that, we've also got the fascinating case of Princess Serafina. And if I can turn back to you, Mark, because Princess Serafina is a character in your play, I but it's based on uh, based on rather than being you know a, a direct lifting of history. So how did you yeah. come to find the history, and then how did you fill in the gaps? Because the thing is, is when we read court cases, we we only kind of get a very skewed view. It is a very very narrow view of what's recorded. I think Princess Serafina is mentioned in a few different sources because she was such a public public figure. So uh, I get the sense with a lot of the a lot of the Molly houses that that um, most, but not all of the men at the Molly houses would would cross dress. Um, but I, I get the sense that most of them, uh, mostly quite young, mostly in working class professions or apprentices in working class professions, I get the sense that they uh, they dressed up when they arrived at the at the house, and possibly even hired the the clothes because um, it's very hard for us now, I think, to conceive how expensive clothes clothes were. Uh, so. I think quite a lot of a prostitute's income would 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 be spent on hiring clothes. They wouldn't own very many clothes because the 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 materials and the labour were, were were just so you know they're just so expensive. There weren't no Primark. Um, it was the complete opposite of of this incredibly cheap clothing that we have now. Um, so I think I think also um, I think there's some evidence for this, but I may just be putting this together from supposition that, that, that probably that Molly, part of Molly House activity was also hiring hiring clothing and dressing when you arrived. But Princess Serafina was a very public figure in, in Covent Garden and would walk around um, all day long, it seems, uh, wearing her drag and would be greeted uh, with fondness and, and friendliness, it's, it's reported by, she was sort of a character uh, of, of Covent Garden. Well, there's Princess Serafina. Hello, Princess Serafina. I think she was probably famous as that man who stood on Oxford Circus for 30 years, eat no, eat no meat, eat no fish. You know, if you lived in London for a certain period, you knew that man. And I think I, I think it would have been the same with Princess Sarah, Serafina, that just almost a London sort of landmark. And I've read no evidence of, I'm not sure there was some, but I, I've read no evidence of a of aggression or unfriendliness towards Princess Serafina, that people were glad it was the highlight of your day. There's Princess Serafina. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> so she sounds rather fabulous. 
I think she was also, it, it's, she often seems to me a bit, because obviously there were no, it was not, we didn't have fashion magazines and there was no way of really understanding fashion. And she's sort of an example of this sort of walking fashion plate because she's such a style leader. I think that, you know, I do think that people got real sort of style ideas from her. I think we could, it would be even called an early influencer if that, that's yeah, not going yeah, yeah, yeah. too far. And I think, um, you know, we've talked about these two areas of, um, the, of the Molly Howes and the Madams, if we put it that, that sort of crudely. I think throughout history, there's always been an interweaving of the experience of sex workers and, and, and gay men. Um, the, the Molly Houses weren't uh, sex for sale. Even when, when I wrote the play and the events were in the play, there was no uh, sex for sale in the Molly Houses in the play, but still it, many critics and stuff sort of wrote about it's set in a brothel and just somehow something in the popular imagination thinks, oh, they're dressing up, they're having sex, they come to this place, there the, the, the must be prostitution involved. And actually there's none, but I think, uh, you know, I think uh, queer people and prostitutes have often found themselves in the similar marginalized spaces and often shared similar marginalized spaces and shared their stories and histories together. Nicknames for one group or the other seem to flow backwards and forwards quite readily. So I think both Queens and Mollies at different periods in time had also been applied to female sex workers. Um, yeah, queer people often get given the same nicknames or, or derogatory names as, as, as sex workers. So I think, you know, partly th just uh, through supposition because that's what tends to happen. I sort of wanted to reflect that in the play as well, that in some ways, there's some sort of rivalry and uh, sort of street battle uh, between the founding of the Molly Houses and the sex worker culture, but also the sex workers and, and, the, and the queens of the Molly Houses actually find that they have a lot of, a lot of shared experiences. And, um, and you know, I think, that, I think that's particularly sort of heightened in this Molly Houses and Madams period, but that, that comes right up pretty much to, you know, the modern day, that that alliance and sometimes misalliance and sometimes frictions, but I think there's always a parallel history in any period that you look between queer people and sex workers. And I think I can, and I think that you know having the Society of Reformation for Manners, who often were undercover kind of undercover agents, you know, you could pass that around in the sort of Covent Garden intelligence that, oh, there's this guy going around and he's pretending he's this, he's this or that, he's pretending he's a client or he's pretending he's a Molly, but he's not, he's an informer. So I think that there was that sort of whisper network by which they all tried to keep themselves safe against the sort of advent of respectable, uh, well, these uh, thief takers who are doing the dirty work of these respectable societies. Yeah, so, so really the, the, the primary source material that I had was uh, when the cases were brought to court, uh, there would be popular pamphlets that we would be produced. So, I, you know, I think there's somebody in there rapidly writing, it's very much like sort of tabloid newspaper stuff. There's somebody in there writing down the events of, of the court highlighting the most salacious bits and then rushing it out into print to sell on, on, on street corners, just a side or so of A4. And obviously you, when the Society for Moral Reform really got going in the second half of the 1720s, I think the real height of this is sort of 1726, 27, 28, is it? When the real rush of sort of court cases come, uh, you know, you can imagine it's, it's on street corners by this paper. Um, so we have a very mangled, history uh, that you have to sort of unpiece. It's, it, it's a bit like having our own history of the gay experience of the 1980s being copies of the Sun newspaper of the time. You have to sort of read between the lines. But um, even so, there is unintentional comedy with those uh, moral reformers. They're sort of saying, well, in these court cases that are then, you know, reported by the leaflets, well, I went once and I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. So I went twice <laughs> and that time I actually, somebody, you know, performed fellatio and I thought, no, no, I think this is a, you know, I think this is a, a place where sodomy happens and so Went back for a third time, put on the dress and just to make sure, you know, and uh, th 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 there is some unintentional humor and that sense that you always get from the, from the snoopers uh, that uh, they go just a bit too often 
and actually, I think there were a few um, Molly informers as well who who sort of uh, turned uh, turned informant. But but I don't that was that doesn't seem to have been a massive phenomenon. It was largely uh, the interlopers, but who would often you know would actually don it seems on the few records that we have would actually don the sort of cross dressing identity to get in, and you know the, and that sort of history of. Uh, pretending uh, to for entrapment essentially. I mean that that co comes up co comes up until I don't know when it stops, but it certainly was still very present in the eighties when I first moved to London. They were called pretty policemen, and policemen who dressed themselves up as gay men and uh, solicited men in public spaces, and then could charge them with acts of gross indecency or whatever the charge was. The, the pretty policeman uh, is is a recurrent figure right up until our, our age. And in a sense, these were sort of undercover pretty policemen. Although, of course, police force doesn't establish. Uh, you know, I think what it's Kate's saying that everybody's on the make, I think that's another thing that seems so sort of um, contemporary to me, that it, it, we're sort of pre almost any sort of state really, apart from the state for war, to make war, policing doesn't really exist. It's more or less individual sort of vigilante forces trying to make a bit of money. And the prison system is so sort of marketized, and which is satirized deliciously in Gay's The Beggar's Opera. That it's, you know, it's expensive to, to stay in a prison and there's a bill of charges for everything. It's an incredibly market driven culture. And there's really, minimal law and and minimal appearance of the state and the actual act of sodomy is illegal there's no sense of a whole identity a whole gay identity or queer identity or homosexuality all those things come a lot later the thing that is criminal and theoretically as criminal as an actor between a man and a woman and a man and a man is the act of sodomy but actually it seems that the uh, occurrence of sodomy was, was very high. Uh, with heterosexual couples as well, how are you not gonna get pregnant? Um, one of your options for a heterosexual couple was anal sex. And obviously option for uh, gay men as well was, was anal sex. And although it was illegal in law, as Kate said, with prostitution, there were hardly any convictions of sodomy for, for for decades, it was punishable by death, I think, by hanging by this stage. I think we've done away with the hung drawing and quartering by now, but, um, but it's like a handful of cases in the whole country until this wave of moral reform happens. Well, I mean, one of the most famous cases in terms of somebody being tried for sodomy is the thief taker, Charles Hitchin, who I think was very famously, you know, he straddled both the law and also the, the world of the Molly House and was very successful, made a lot of money from it, um, but then ultimately was met with his downfall when he was, he was found out as well as being a, a sodomite. But I, too I much straddling. To, <laughs> I want to turn to you, Kate. Could have talk about, um, let's come to the idea of sensual pleasure again. And let's talk about female sensual pleasure because I think there's a writer who's in, we're still in the uh, 1720s and there's a writer who effectively will have their writing and theatre uh, impacted by a law, an act, uh, the Licensing Act in, in 1937, but in the 20s, she is probably at the height of her creative power. She was writing at a prolific rate. And so can you tell us about uh, Eliza Haywood, please? Well, it's it, yeah, so fascinating, Dan, because um, we had, just as Mark was saying about these pamphlets going out onto the onto the um onto the street you know immediately the court case would happen out goes the pamphlet you know it's, it's almost like you know live tweeting that everyone wants to see this sensational news you really do see a surge in the written word as well in the in the early 17th century and a real sort of fascination with buying with books with pamphlets and there's lots of um there's lots of uh, sort of uh, sort of gatekeeping from authors saying, oh, you know, they're just, they're just, uh, just, just hacks, you know, sending off stuff and we're real authors. But, and it's that, that's really that kind of dialogue of some people like Fielding has really obscured to us who, Henry Fielding, um, author of Tom Jones, he was very much like, I am an author, you are not, has really obscured to us, I think, a lot of the people writing about real life 
London and real life Covent Garden. And there's this author I'm fascinated by, Eliza Hayward. I've just been writing on her. And she was very active. She was an actress, then she became a writer. And she was in this coterie in the uh, big, very beginning of the 1720s, by which she kind of, she and her friends, male and female, swapped sort of very highly sexualized writing. And it really came into her actual writing. So she, her first book is Love in Excess, which is a complete uh, blockbuster, huge bestseller. I think a fantastic title all about Count Delmont and his uh, advent adventures with Meliora who keeps resisting him. And the kind of eroticism of the, of the love scenes is, is really intimate. You know, she, she, her, 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 her her heart is beating in her breast, the her frosted round heart is about to shatter. And you see this real surge in erotic writings for women. And it, it's fascinating because we're talking very much about what life was like for young men who moved to the city, who wanted to explore their sexuality, young men who who who, you, who had this great safe place in the Molly houses to 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 engage, to to have love, to to be in love with another man and, and do that freely. And you want you know wonder what was, what was happening with the women. And it's of course, lesbian activity has never been um, you know cracked down on so hard. Um, and it's often I think sort of particularly in this time kind of forgiven because you know if she's not hanging out this someone's daughter if it's your daughter she's not hanging out with a boy he's not going to get her pregnant she's just cuddling up with another girl and that's just female friendship so a lot of what you see is codified as close female friendships we we might look at now and say how how close is that getting it's obviously queen anne who was um, on the throne at the turn of the century, the beginning of the 18th century. She uh, was, very, was very celebrated and very, and very attacked for having a too close friendship with Sarah, Duchess of, with Sarah Duchess of Marlborough and then with Abigail Hill, who was Sarah's relation, uh, really seems a very lower class relation and replaced uh, Sarah in Anne's affections. And the film Queen Anne, uh, was it last year? Film last year, last year, time go the, the year before, time goes, you know, now uh, was all about the, the closeness of lesbian relationships. But it really interests me that Mary II, who was William and Mary's, as a William and Mary, she had a very, she was Anne's sister, of course, had a very close female friendship with a, with a female friend before she got married. Incredibly um, effusive, incredibly um, emotional. And it really is very inter interesting to me where the, where the activity is, and certainly what Hayward does is create this sort of huge amount of emotion, of sexual activity, of sexual feeling. Her books really are about sexual emotion, and some of them are, you know, they're <laughs> just astonishing what she's writing about, and they were incredibly successful. So these kind of books. Uh, are really not what the Society of Reformation Manners want. They're the absolute antithesis where women and men can really read about sexual feeling, sexual pleasure. And certainly the people who hated the most thought that she and other female authors who, who uh, go fo follow, you know, plow the same furrow because it's a very lucrative one are pushing people to immorality and vice. And I, I think that this moment, she, she had a, a shop much later at Covent Garden. She then, after 1720, she was wrote these massive blockbusters. Then she went to the theater, then the licensing act really pushed her into books. And she wrote post Samuel Richardson's Pamela, very moralistic books. And she was a chameleon and she had a bookshop as well in Covent Garden. I think that, you know, she really shows us how there were women working and living and sort of capitalizing on sexual pleasure, but so many of them have been lost to us. And luckily she kept on writing, but she also, there's also the, you know, her, people go to banyos and there's, there's a, one of the most, it's quite interesting to me, one of the most famous Covent Garden courtesans in the early 1720s were called Betsy Careless. She was terribly successful. Apparently her legs were marvelous. And, um, I, I'm, the thing is, it's the legs that matter in the 18th century for women. It's legs, that's it. No one bothers about boobs, it's legs. And there are some courtesans who make a huge amount of money just walking up and down um, St. James's, flashing their ankles because you never see a woman's legs. And she had these marvelous legs and someone said they were so perfect, they were like twins. And she said, no, 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 they're not twins, had too much between them. But she, Betsy Careless <laughs> is one of the major um, famous uh, sex workers, courtesans, and this is before Covent Garden ladies, the, the Harris's book of Covent Garden ladies in, in 1760 started describing them. And what, but 
Eliza Haywood comes back and writes this terribly moralistic novel, but she's about Betsy, Th this novel's called Betsy, comparatively not moralistic novel, and she's about Betsy Thoughtless. And I always think Betsy Thoughtless, Betsy Careless, is there something? Mm -hmm. But but yes, you know, uh, se a sex worker with good legs, she could earn a, a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, Eliza Haywood was, is said by some to be able to seduce by prose alone. Did that therefore put her, you know, was she at loggerheads quite regularly with the, the, the society or did she evade their, their attention somehow? I think she was consistently at loggerheads. There was consistently arguments that her books were um, shocking, her books were bad, her books would persuade young people into... into sexual activity horrors uh, and you and you really see uh, just as mark was saying you start to see a surge at post 1720s of um uh, prosecutions you really see a surge against her and other writers like her and of course by the 1740s it's all about the moral novel it's about samuel richardson who steals all her ideas but says he doesn't uh, and says he's he said oh the idea for pamela just popped into my head and the idea for clarissa in which he's constantly using her her, her tropes and her work just popped into my head and uh, and so the novel become becomes male it becomes about moral it becomes about teaching people the right way it becomes middle class it becomes respectable but in the early 1720s you really see this surge of the idea that women are the ones who can write about sexual feeling and women are the ones who understand sexual feeling and i i certainly think that that scene is too dangerous and we have to remember of course at this point that m the majority of people believe that um, to conceive, you uh, both the man and the woman need to have sexual pleasure, that um, they don't understand spontaneous female ovulation until fully, don't fully understand it till much later in, in the century. And the whole phrase lie back and think of England is, you know, you know, very complicated to even says that, but you know, the, that, you know, it's certainly not, but in the 18th century, you know, you, it, it's about, so you have much later in the 18th century, Dr. James Graham sets up his, um, celestial bed in 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 the strand in which it costs 50 pounds a night and it's full of, and it's about pleasure and it's about you know and it's about you know wonderful electricity electrocuting you into pleasure and about girls dancing around it in beautiful outfits like emma hamilton who was one of his goddesses and that's the idea behind that is that sexual pleasure will produce an heir so you really you see this compact you see this sort of alliance of women and sexual feeling that um that uh, starts to be stamped down on very much, partly by the society, but I'd say much more by writers such as Fielding, writers such as Richardson, who, who, who say she's a disgrace, who say she's a shock, you know, shocking person and try and scrub her out of literary history. Okay, I want to stay with you just a moment to talk about that idea of gal pals, but uh, we will be coming to Q&A from the public as well. So if you've got questions, please do put them into the question section and we'll come to those in about uh, 10 minutes or so. But hey, that idea of gal pals or, you know, what we might now call lesbian relationships, how much of that is available to find uh, from the time? You know, it's not something that really went through the old Bailey or as much, did it? Um, no, so, it so how can we find it? And sorry, second part of the question was just, sorry, just, sorry. Um, um, Eliza Haywood. You know, can can we read her her texts in a queer context as well? Can we queer her texts as well to read in a queer lens? Yes, I think that that you are absolutely. You've put your finger on it there, Dan. You know, how do we find out about this activity if it's not prosecuted? If it's if there's a blind eye turn to it, and we only we of course only have Mary the Second's letters to her this her beloved female friend, and she was devastated to leave her behind when she had to go off to Holland to marry William. You know, heartbroken, and William himself had many male favourites. And it, it may it may definitely be the case that that was that was a, a sort of obviously it was an arranged marriage it was a royal marriage that they were very fond of each other as friends but they they were else they both um, their minds were elsewhere in terms of personal pleasure that's that's an interesting question and so we it's very hard to know it's very hard to locate obviously for wealthy women such as Anne Lister much later that's something that obviously was found very very much later in the archives um, because you know it's it, it, there's a I mean, there was a very high burden of prosecution on um, sodomy, I believe, if I've got this right. You had to prove penetration. You had to um, have witnesses. So uh, many prosecutions failed. And uh, uh, so sodomitical intent was much more often what they could manage to prosecute for. And with women, I, I think it's, it's, it's seen as, I think it's often very much dismissed as sort of harmless 
female friendships, it's simply not taken seriously by the patriarchy. The patriarchy just think, oh, well, that, you know, that, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. That's not a threat. Uh, and, and certainly there have been some fantastic queer readings of Eliza Hay with Catherine Ingracia has written very strong about the, the queer readings. There's a book called The British Recluse where these two, two women meet in a, 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 sort of a hotel really. And they find out that they've both been seduced or betrayed by the same guy. And um, that's really interesting because you can read it very much in a queer context that they are, on one hand, they're pouring out their hearts about this idiot guy. But on the other hand, they're creating a sexual bond together, a, a bond of sexual emotion. And that certainly, I think that what what is often being read as female friendship is, is can be read as much more so um and certainly can be inserted into a into a into a queer reading in a time when it really wasn't understood but i mean whether or not we have evidence of of whether or not there is you know what uh, how it's it, you know the, the evidence that we've got it's it's so it is sadly partial and but i think that there is definitely more to be found Thank you. And in terms of staying with that idea of seduction by prose, back to you, Mark. <laughs> so the, the I wish idea, I had the power. I mean, the idea here of uh, Eliza Haywood, a person who effectively was writing plays for theatre and effectively was stopped from being able to have their works performed because in 1937, the Licensing Act comes along. Mm. I mean, in your time, you've probably seen uh, British theatre completely change and the idea of censorship being Britain being one of the most censored theatre uh, worlds uh, parts of the world um, yeah. to, to where it's you started creating. It's incredible how long that theatre uh, theater censorship lasted for. So it gets introduced in this, in this period. You know, this isn't just the one society for moral reform. I think there's a whole wider movement, which largely comes from the sort of mercantile middle class. They both want to... Uh, clamp down on, on, on the aristocratic class and gain power from them. It, it, essentially, you know, the people with money from trade before the people with money from land and inherited wealth. But also they obviously want to reign in the, the, the working class as well. And, and, and they propagate moral reforms in much, much wider ways. But one of the things that comes out of that is, is, is theatre censorship. And that same theatre censorship with the role being given to the Lord Chamberlain, who must read all plays before they're produced and uh, decide what's appropriate for the stage. That lasts until the end of the 1960s. Um, and it's really through the... Uh, a, a lot of the push for the end of that um, theatre censorship towards the end of the 1960s comes, comes from the Royal Court Theatre, uh, which is where I had my first play produced, not at the end of the 1960s, nearly 30 years later, but still very much, you know, in the longer span of history, still within that first generation or two that was finally benefiting or experiencing the ending of that theatre censorship that had lasted for, what's that, 250 years or something. And coming up to the 20th anniversary of Mother Claps Molly Houses then, how was the play received when it first uh, premiered at the National Theatre? Um, it was, I mean, very well received. Um, I think people, I mean, a, a, I think just, you know, even just a few uh, nuggets of facts about the Molly Houses is, is incredible. So I think that makes people hungry for it. I think it felt naughty that somewhere called the National, it still felt sort of naughty that somewhere like the National Theatre was, was presenting something which was sort of uh, from, a, from another culture. And I think what was interesting was that we had such a diverse audience in terms of age, but also in terms of heritage and ethnicity that I, that I think people identified with the, with, with the sort of queerness of it. So it was actually, I think, practically the most diverse audience that I've, I've ever had for one of my plays. So that was exciting. I'd like to just ask you one more question to do with it. Uh, a recent production that you did, which was The Boy in the Dress. And yeah. uh, there's a group that you've got, which is, you know, we've got more vocabulary now for gender fluidity and trans issues. And so revisiting the idea of Mother Clubs and Molly Houses and having to think about uh, different ways of uh, ways that we talk about gender now, how, how might you reapproach it now? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's what's so exciting is that the language, uh, the sort of toolkit that, that's been developed over 
the last decade or so at least has become you know more available to to more of us in the in the last decade it would be great to go back to the, that material and explore it i'm watching uh the tv show pose uh which i've caught up with over lockdown um you know that all the issues there to do with that that trans identity in new york in the 80s and black trans identity and stuff you know there's a whole language there that has so much in common with the molly houses and i'd love to go back and revisit the material maybe on screen uh with in the light of yeah scholarship but also just general awareness that that we all have now about about gender fluidity and non-binary and trans and languages that were still pretty crude or non-existent when it, you know even when i wrote the the play 20 20 years ago i i'm still fascinated by the material and i'd love to go back and revisit it in some shape or form i think i think it'd be i think it'd be a fantastic tv series you know all the different stories you could look at all the individual lives and yeah. um it would just you know all the different people who came and, and what they what they you know i just think it would, it would be a wonderful tv series if, if um it would <laughs> it would so and netflix let's make it happen yeah and we'll all make an argument to be cast in it as well <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. i'd be a really good extra yeah <laughs> uh, a molly a molly or a madam um well, I, I, I mean, I, I think, I think, I, I think, I, I don't know. I think, I think, I could, I think, I could play all, all kinds. But I think that, um, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm up for any role that Mark's going to offer me. I'll take an, any, anything he'd like. Uh, I'll do. Yeah, it. you can, and you can invent your, own, you can invent your own Molly name. I mean, Princess Serafina is sort of slightly different. Quite often, it was actually a sort of some variation on a craft or a, or, a, or a trade followed by so if anybody at home wants to make up their molly name you have the second part as Noll Nol or nancy or moll or something like that so so you know you, you can quite not often put pig bot pig butcher nan or something like that if anybody at home wants to play the game of naming people in their house or with their molly names sort of a combination of a site quite a sort of macho sounding trade followed by by quite a sort of a feminine name it's quite a good way if anybody would like to start self-identifying as a Molly after this some evening. From, some from your play is China Mary, Primrose Mary, Garter yeah. Mary, Orange Mary. I, I think they're all people mentioned in, yeah, they're all people mentioned in the records. I didn't make any of those up, but yeah, China Mary, Primrose Mary, yeah. I think Mary was quite, I think Mary's quite popular in, and still in, in gay slang up until quite recently. Oh, Mary, <laughs> was, you know, and that, and that goes right back. There are lots of those men then we're calling each other Mary, and and it remained until quite recently quite just a popular uh, catch-all nickname for gay, gay men to call each other. I do think Mother Clap's an amazing figure. I mean, she doesn't seem to have made much money out of this business. It's a, you know, she just clearly did it because I think out of love for for the people for the people around oh, her. Yeah, the sense it, yeah of actually building the, this sense of the house, the home. You know that, that that idea that came became so popular in the 1990s of creating your logical family rather than your biological yeah, yeah. family. It does, you know, maybe we're romanticizing it, but it does feel like that was one of the urges of somebody like Mother Clap was to form a sort of logical family with an element of parody about it as well, both a logical family and a sort of parody family. Uh, and I, I, a very subversive, very playful thing to do. I, I, I do think you're I, playing, uh, Kate, go on. So I, I must I know you're going to question, but I do think that you know there's very strict uh, gender gender rules in the 18th century and very strict dress rules. I mean, obviously women can't wear trousers, men can't wear dress, but you do see fascinating uh, fluidity within this. Princess Serafina is just a brilliant example, and, and people wearing the clothes that, as Mark was saying, you know, there's no way that anyone owned these clothes; they had to hire them. But you know, you see so many fascinating. Uh, women crossed women dressing as men going going to war going as sailors and people are fascinated by these stories and mm. women, women's identity within this you know are they transmasculine are they are they trans men you know are they what well, what are they it's really interesting question you know and there were all these fascinating identities that that are really um that are really kind of accepted so you see women dressing as men and going to war for a variety of reasons some of them many reasons and I think some of them because they do want to live as men and often they are accepted when they are discovered they are they are accepted and I think that we sometimes see the past as uh, as more unforgiving than it than it was I think. Well I've got a question from Claire Mead who was a historian on women and swords so an apt 
um, part now to, to take to, to Claire's question, which is, um, Kate, what sort of evidence do we have of lesbian and bi women taking part in culture in and around Molly houses, either as mothers or otherwise? You know, were there women who were sex workers for women, for example? It's an interesting, fascinating question. And yes, there must be, but we don't have so many records of them. Um, but there must be women who are working as absolutely the evidence. We need much more evidence, and I think much more research in this, but certainly in Covent Garden, you could get whatever you wanted and there was someone to offer you whatever you wanted. And there were men, and many women, I think, you know, the, the, the great thing Mark was just saying about, you know, the, the, the great thing, the, the great teller of anyone in the, 18, in the early 18th century, for a woman, it's pregnancy, because how are you going to support your child? We have the foundling hospital, of course, you know, a little bit later, but the foundling hospital, it's very hard to get in there. You know, you, you, you're very lucky. And also the you know, venereal disease is spreading. There were all kinds of quack doctors selling venereal disease um, cures on the corner. And there is definitely, you know, obviously, so you, women, feel that they're not going to catch venereal disease from, their other, from each other. And there, there is feelings that you're not going to catch venereal disease from anal sex as well. So they are, we, you know, that we need, we do need more evidence, but there are, you know, there, you know, there are, there are women who uh, work for women who are sex workers for women. And for many women, um, that was seen as really an activity which was less likely to get you pregnant and less like, or have to use those douches that, you know, that they might use or any types of, you know, there were rudimentary condoms, but they weren't really very effective. And, um, and, and venereal disease as well, which is everyone's terror. Everyone's terrified of venereal disease because once you have that, um, that's, not only can you not work, but really it is a, some people do get better, but it is really generally a death sentence. Well, Dominic has actually sent in a question as well, related slightly to that, uh, that point, which is uh, Dominic's been reading about uh, Madame Four cards on Leather Lane and uh, Mercury baths and pox houses. And these are places where people might go to when they've got the first signs of STDs. Are you able to speak any more on that, Kate? Mercury, so Mercury is what is seen as the place to cure an STT. ST, so that's so that's going to clear cure, cure syphilis. I mean, syphilis and gonorrhea are the main other are the, are the diseases at this time, and they are spreading like wild wildfire. They spread, um, they spread through particularly through the forces. Mark was just saying how the state, how the the state at the time doesn't really have much. What it does is wage war, and it wages war continually. It wages war continually throughout the period and into the 19th century. And of course, in the 19th century, you have uh, the locking, the the, the 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 Contagious Diseases Act, the locking up of prostitutes because it's their fault that men in port towns, in army towns, have got venereal disease. So they're the ones who get locked up and um, you know subject to horrific investigations. Uh, so. You, you know, but in the early 18th century, what you have in this, this fear that, that, of course, the great fear is, is that a, a man's going to catch venereal disease and bring it home to his virtuous wife. You know, just It is the mercantile class trying to protect what they see as their morality and that he's going to catch it. So you can go, yes, and have these early mercury baths. Mercury is thought to be a cure. So the majority of um. Uh, cures are mercury baths of actually drinking, you know, imbibing the stuff. Uh, and, and um, you know, you see it quite interesting in caricatures at the time. If mercury is around, if there's any kind of suggestion of mercury that all automatically is saying that this is a person with venereal disease. And James Graham, who I was talking about a little bit earlier, who has this celestial bed, which you can use um, for 50 pounds a night, which guarantees you an heir um, with all the sexual pleasure. He also deals in what... He, uh, they are very euphemistically described what he's dealing in. He, he electrical ether and electrical pills and electrical cream, but they are definitively um, uh, cures for venereal disease. You can you, you're supposed to take this ether and venereal disease can be cured because, of course, there were no cures for syphilis and gonorrhea at the time, and people suffered greatly, and they were always looking for the signs of the pox on people because just like uh, the, the horrific pandemic we're in the, in the midst of, people could have syphilis and gonorrhea without showing symptoms and without thinking they're infectious and could continue to, to do what they did and, and, and infect it. So they are, 
uh, very effective viruses, it's the brutally effective viruses in that sense, and and they are the, the constant fear of those who are who are living there, particularly um, the the sex workers at the very bottom, because the top ones can insist on. Uh, precautions they can insist on condoms and and and, and proportions uh, and what they feel they won't get it from but the ones at the bottom really can't and it's suffering so so people make a lot of money <laughs> people do make a huge amount of money out of cures quack cures mercury bars mercury cures so uh, as mark was saying everyone's on the make and in including mercury you know curing the diseases on the make as well well, to Mark, I might put a question from Susie, which is to say, to ask, is this the most debauched era in London history? <laughs> history? And, um, and why have we got such a, 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 a simple reading of it? You know, nice ladies in bonnets. Uh, I don't know about the most debauched. It's certainly true that, um, you know, the proportion of sex workers remains very, very high in London, obviously, right, way, you know, way into the 19th century. And I can't remember exactly what the figures are for this period, but it's an incredibly high percentage of the female population. It's often said in what, one in eight, isn't it? So there's workers, roughly one workers, in eight. Sex workers. So I don't know whether, yeah. you, whether one regards sex, sex workers uh, as debauched. I mean, there's quite a lot of records of open air uh, gay cruising as well as, as well as the indoor molly houses. Uh, there's there's quite a lot, I, th I think, places like Lincoln's in Fields and stuff. I can't remember the exact locations, but there's there's quite a lot of records of um, of open air gay gay cruising areas as well. I think what's incredible is, uh, as uh, we were saying, it's the strange thing is with so much queer history, it becomes visible when it's made illegal, and that is why so much lesbian history it's is so invisible because yeah. because the law never even <laughs> bothers to make. Patriarchy didn't care, yeah. To make lesbians illegal. But but when crackdown's legal illegality is, is applied to sodomy and then the gay identity, queer identity, then suddenly it's, it, something becomes visible. So there is a sort of, you know, sense in which Foucault was right about that, that we, we get these sort of strange histories made by the law. You make it, you make it illegal, but at the same time, you, you make it visible. But I think what's incredible is that that... Uh, moral reform in these court cases and the visibility happens in the second half of the 1720s. But far, as far as I can tell, this Molly House culture, the cruising culture, everything about it was at least 20 or 30 years. And I don't think we're just talking about two or three Molly Houses. I think we're talking like about 20 or 30 in a considerably smaller city. I think every neighborhood must have had a, a Molly House and probably had an open air cruising area as well. I think, although we sort of love to tell the history and, and I suppose rightly of oppression, actually I think what's interesting is the long period, unrecorded period before the oppression came when Londoners must have been so familiar, either turned a blind eye or maybe open, threw their arms open wide. But I think there was a very acknowledged and out there uh, queer culture before it gets recorded because it becomes oppressed. Well, speaking of open air, I mean, the Old Bailey at the time was an open air court. So in the early 18th century, they would have oh, had really? the court cases in the open air, which is remarkable because uh, to, to prevent the spread of the disease. Um, but oh. the they were hardier than us standing outside all day. And you know, <laughs> these are the times when the Thames froze over. It was seriously chilly. So <laughs> we, were, we were obviously not as hardy. There's a question from Lynn Marie uh, for you, perhaps, Kate, which is what was the punishment for people who were put on trial and they were, you know, uh, put on trial for being a sodomite? Well, that was hanging. So it was the ultimate punishment um, that you would that you would be hanged for sodomy. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, and so you were taking a risk, but at the same time, just as we were saying, it seems like the, the, the level of activity that seems to be going on really was not reflected in the amount of of, um, of of actual successful prosecutions. Now, some failed. For example, um, Mrs. Clapp, she she gave evidence so that one of the men that she was so that was friendly with in her house that he would not go he would not go down. She said it's just not true. And you had to, and I believe, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I think this is the case that you have to prove penetration, which is obviously quite difficult. You have to you have to have witnesses, and therefore the majority of times you cannot prove that and what a, two men could say if they were in a, in a house together we were just having a chat you know we we're just talking about play, talking about football and you can't yeah. 
so 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 it is it, you know the 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 ultimate but you know of course in the 18th century all all crimes that they perceived as crime many crimes that we perceived as crimes you would it was very severe punishments hanging for quite minor levels potentially for quite minor levels of theft so it was a brutal punitive regime well we're coming to the end now so i think i'm going to turn to you for the last uh, your last thoughts in just a moment and then we'll have a goodbye from rebecca but um i just wanted to point out that uh, there's a few there's lots of questions that have come up and so i'm sure we you know we can turn to social media and, and help answer some of those um but uh you know if you want to find out for example uh susie wants to know where the name molly came from and uh we've got uh, uh sam who'd like to know some about about some of the the the, the relationships and the ceremonies that happened and there's another question in there about uh about dancing and, and what happens. I mean, you can read Mark's play, uh, that's available. Uh, you can also read Victor Norton's um, book of the same name, so Mother Claps Molly House, I, I recommend both of those. Um, but uh, if I could turn to Mark first and then Kate, you know, what, what would you like people to walk away with uh, thinking about George and London and these subcultures that we've been talking about today? Yeah, I, I, I think the main thing for me is this incredible period that must have been of of tolerance and, and acceptance actually that uh, I'm more or less repeating my last point really but that, that when it's when it's when the law comes down that things become visible but to imagine that that period of tolerance and acceptance I think is quite is quite interesting and although yeah it confirms some of our sense of 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 what of of, 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 of things that we would like to be where we find a very happy place to be I think in some ways imagining that and we are imagining a lot of it in between a few a few facts and figures I think there's some things that are so different as well I mean the sense of the effeminate uh, and that the, the equation of the gay man with effeminacy was not really such a thing effeminacy was associated with men who had had too much sex with women and this is this is something that flips our modern heads because James Bond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th 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 there's the character of the fop in the Restoration play, very well dressed, very elegantly spoken. They're nearly always played now as though they were they were effeminate gay men. The idea of the fop was that they had slept with so many women that they have absorbed femininity and become beca become feminized. I just want to throw that in at the end because it sort of flips so many of our associations. We assume just naturally now, or not we assume, but we say it's the cliche, the more women you've slept with, the more masculine you must be. But this notion that the more women you slept with, the more you absorb their femininity and, and ended up as a fop, I think really flips around all our sort of cliche. Those female fluids, they just absorb yeah, inside I, I think you. Literally, I think there was a sense <laughs> of absorbing the fluids, yeah. yeah. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but you know, so that just flips, plays around with our sense of, I don't think gay, or there wasn't gay or there wasn't homosexual, but men having sex with men was not associated with effeminacy as it so often is, which is sort of interesting. How about you, Kate? Oh, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I agree that, you know, there was so much more acceptance than we would have thought of, 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 of 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 so many LGBTQ behaviors and and, and lifestyles that we, we people people I think Princess Serafina are many examples the women who went to war many examples and 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 these, this really fascinates me just as Mark was saying this at this the way in which we impose I think Victorian morality on the 18th century when there was a I think a greater concept of gender fluidity than certainly there was in the Victorian times and the other thing of course is the society for reformation and how much you know it was the opposite of helping and protecting those you know they like to talk about the innocence swept up in the tra in the in the sex trade and, and sex workers and young girls who were suffering and taken by boards but of course that was just their excuse really under it all it was about seizing power and seizing because they really weren't there to help these young trafficked women these women who were who were suffering and they were really what they what they of course wanted was these these sex workers who were out and proud and were just going to do it. And those are the ones they wanted to, to push inside. And, 
And what you do see, of course, at the, at the end of the 18th century, the progress in the 19th century is that uh, prostitution, sex work in particular, goes behind closed doors. And that actually becomes much, almost much more dangerous. And you see W.T. Stead writing about how these houses, suburban houses, are, are places of horrendous suffering because these women are trafficked, can't escape, they're imprisoned. Uh, and, and certainly I think that uh, the, the moral crusades uh, <clears throat> did nothing to help uh, young sex workers in Covent Garden in the 18th century or, or in the in the 19th century but uh, yes I think it's a, it's a fasc it's a fascinating period and I, I can't I can't imagine what it must have been like just to walk through it and, and see all the activity all the hustle and bustle of course it seems impossible now for us ever to go out anywhere but <laughs> but, but, uh, but it, it, it was it was both a place of danger and a place of danger and terror and a place of great beauty and and friendship as well for me i suppose if i can just fixate on that idea of friendship I, i'd love to return to that idea that mark set up which is sort of the molly house as a place where chosen family is is found and or in the words of mark's words in the play is it's a place for the global disco family so I think if we can leave that as a as a lingering <laughs> and happy thought, I think that's where we can come to a close. So, Mark, Kate, thank you so much for tonight. Thank it's been an absolute thank you. It was thank really you. fascinating. I've learned a lot, <laughs> and I've learned so much. And we just we all now need to get you know get Mark on the Netflix ne next next yes, Christmas please. series. Yes, yeah, we're going to watch. Yeah, I'll be I'll, I'll be in it. And um, yeah, thank you so much for everyone at home who's been watching and all your yeah. questions. And it's been it, it's just been wonderful to be in such a privilege to be in your homes when we can't be together, but such a privilege to be beamed into your homes and talking to you about, about history. Thank you. And back to now to the studio for Rebecca. Mm. A huge thank you to Dan, Mark, Kate, and you, our audience. Please remember to submit feedback if you can, and also do check out the What's On pages on the British Library's website for more cultural events. If you'd like to find out more about HistFest, you can find HistFest via the website, which is www.histfest.org. Thank you.